Dr. Angela McBurdy of drflute.com. Today's flute tip is on finding the musical line. I remember playing a lesson for a teacher of mine, Georgetta Maiolo is her name. And I came in, I think it was the Hindemith Sonata, and I just played that opening uh, phrase. And uh, she stopped me and said, okay, here's a story from her childhood playing that. Now she was a child prodigy and she premiered uh, or played with the soloed with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra when she was 15 years old. And she took lessons from some of the old greats. Now their way of teaching would probably not be okay today, but this is what she had. She said a teacher, her teacher at that time, I will not name who it was, uh, threw a chair across the room and said, get out and come back when you play that musically. And she had no idea what she did wrong somewhere in the age of 15 or 16. And uh, so she left and went to a, a practice room and um, some kind soul came in and said, okay, here, let me tell you what to do because she really had no idea. But what she was telling me that story for is she wasn't going to do that with me, but she was saying that I wasn't playing the musical line. I was playing all the notes on the page, but I was not playing the musical line. And it really opened up my eyes to what is here. It's like reading a story or reading a book. And then you go to your English class and find out there's all these hidden meanings in that book. It's not just the story or the words on the page. When you are looking at your solo, you want to find that musical line because it's going to be meaningful to you. It's going to add so much more interest to you, uh, the player, than also the person who's listening to that piece of music. It's, um, it's going to make um, you making music. It's going to reach your soul like playing the notes doesn't really do. So here, let me just talk about that. There's now different, different ways of finding the musical line, um, finding it in your etudes and knowing regular bar lengths, which don't have regular bar lengths and say Bach, um, and, uh, modern music in the 20th and 21st century is not going to follow the same kind of phrase length, or we start here on a one and we, the first phrase and we end on a five chord, and then we go from five back to one in the next phrase. Uh, but you could still extrapolate from what we're talking about and apply it to your solo. And I will look at, uh, both a, um, a Mozart concerto and Machinsky who was writing in the 1900s and show you a little bit about that musical line. Now the opening here of the Mozart concerto, which I played at the very beginning, this is the concerto in D. What I want to do when I look at this opening phrase, it's easy to know where the opening phrase is because I start at A or where you come in and then there's three beats rest at the end of it. So I know that that's where I'm going to. Now I, I look at this and say, what are the predominant notes? And here, um, our predominant notes are one and five G and D, and then we're ending on, um, a B. So G, B, D, that's our, our chord. And, uh, we're going to play probably notes in those chords to really establish the key. Now, every solo that you have, especially if they're in 20th and 21st century, they're not going to stay with that key or it's not going to be outlined, but you can determine sometimes it's a motive that you're looking for or your ear. You just listen to your ear or your ear listens to your music that you're playing and says, ah, I feel like there's a, you know, I'm my ears resting when I get to this spot uh, or the motive. I'm just going to play the motive musically. And then I will apply that to the next phrase. So, um, think about it. Don't throw everything away because you're playing something from the 21st century and it doesn't follow the same keys, one and five being important. But if I play this opening here, now I didn't try to play it terribly musically. I started with a G. If I were to play out, pull out the important notes, I would play, I would pull out those notes, which was just G, 
D, high D, and then I skipped over to the D, C-sharp trill, and the B. Because that's where I'm going to shape my phrase. I know that those are the important notes, and now I need to play them in a musical line. So I'm going to play all the way down to that B, right at the very end of that phrase, and make sure that I'm pulling my air through that phrase and not just letting it end on each note. So if I play the 16th notes coming down, that's just playing the notes. That's not playing them musically. So maybe I want to play them slurred first. And make sure I'm pushing down through that run, that I'm not just letting it hang out there, just playing it with no uh, air pressure, no support behind it. This is no support. And this is with support. I had a little bit more resonance to my tone because I was supporting it more and you felt like the wave, the musical line, the wave of that was going to the B. Now if I add the beginning, I want to make sure that I'm playing a bunch of Ds and, and when you have a bunch of the same note in a row, they can often just be dead. It's just a whole bunch of them. So you have to think, I, I like to think there, it's just in the first measure, so I'm not ending anything, but that I'm bouncing, all right? I'm bouncing from one D to the next D to the next D. And then on the D, on beat four, I'm going to grow it a little bit. So in essence, put a tiny bit of a crescendo on it so that I can get to that high D and feel like it is part of this musical line. you would never know that I put a little crescendo. You wouldn't say that. However, now that I've told you, there's a tiny, tiny bit of a crescendo on beat four into beat one of the second measure, then you could start hearing that and go, oh yeah, there, there is. It's a little bit more push from my support. All right, now I'm going to put all those aspects together and go all the way down to the B at the end. I'm not letting up on my support until I end that last B. I don't want it tapered into nothingness. I'm going to keep it full and just tapered off on a full note. So that's just the opening phrase. Now I'm going to look at the rest of this and look for my phrases again. Of course, this is after I've learned some technique uh, because you're not going to play it in tempo if you don't have it in your fingers, but you still can make it a phrase going slowly. Let's just talk about Machinsky a little bit here. I have Machinsky's three preludes. I'm looking at a little bit of the second movement. Now you have lots of different keys going on here, but uh, some phrase or, or some slurs help me to know where I'm going at the beginning. And so I'm going to use that to help me shape where I'm going. There's not going to be a cadence point and there's rest. This is for flute alone. So probably not going to find too many rests to indicate that I'm at a cadence point. So let me play the opening. <laughs> Now I played that as musically as I could, uh, and that's because I know it. If I didn't know this piece, I'd have to play around with it a little bit to say, where am I going with it? Now it's only the first measure and a half. I don't want to make too big of a cadence at the uh, middle of the second measure because I'm going to keep going. But if I just take that out and say, where is that first slur section going? Uh, I can see that I'm ascending. And where's the highest point? The highest point is an A. So I'm going to take my phrase up to that A and then come back down as I descend back down to a B flat. Now, I'm not going to make that be this taper into nothingness. It's a measure and a half in. 
I'll take my breath and come back in on the next note, knowing that I'm going to continue the second half of that phrase. <laughs> Now, something that helps me to go to that's a G flat, right, right before the high A, uh, is there, there's a crescendo and a diminuendo. So that gives me an indication of what the composer wants as well. So on that G flat. And then I drop down. Breathe, but I don't want to breathe as in that's the end. seeing that he's got these pinnacles, these high notes in there that will help me know where to go. He's got these crescendos and then diminuendo and then a crescendo and diminuendo. And I've got to use all those factors to help me know how, where the phrase is going, what's important and what I should bring out. Uh, here, we're going to take this all the way. The first three lines gives me the whole opening phrase here. And um, I, if I'm looking at it, I see a high G is the top right before a rest. And so I know that I'm going to be moving towards that high G, a third octave G, and we only come down to a high C right after that. So I'm not going down too far, although it does diminuendo. So here there's a, oh, there's a give and a take, a pull and a push as you are playing this opening. And it's your job to figure out what you want to bring out. Maybe where you aim for your phrase is a little bit different than where I aim for the phrase because you hear something different and that's okay. That allows, that's why musicianship is a fantastic thing and why three different performances will give you three different ideas of what's important in that phrase. And you can decide which one you like. So that's my idea. And the flute tip for today is finding the musical line and make sure that you are playing with that musical line in mind so that you're not just playing the notes on the page, but you're making music. That's today's flute tip.